Lord, you are great. You are gracious and good. And as we come and open your word together, I pray that you'd open our hearts to your word, that you transform our minds as we look into um, how great you are in the word that you've given to reveal how your greatness to us in, in your word, the Bible. And I just pray right now that as we look into it, that you would help us to see Christ and to be transformed. And so, Lord, may you be in our midst as we read and study your word right now. Through Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We are going to be in Philippians. And uh, as I read this passage, uh, it's starting in verse 3. Could we stand for the reading of God's word if you're able to? So, Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Philippians 3, I mean, Philippians 1, 3 through 11, sorry. Um, here Paul begins with prayer and thanksgiving. So he says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayers with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is good for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of the grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for that day, the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. You may be seated. You know, conflict deals very specifically with who you are united with. You think about today, and we see conflict all around the world. One example would be Russia and Ukraine, right? And as you, as you think about conflict, Russia does not want Ukraine to be united with the European Union. Well, in the same way, our enemy does not want sinners united with Christ. In a similar way, you think of it, that that is the conflict that we exist in our world today. So conflict is inevitable if the gospel is progressing, if the good news is going forward and sinners are coming from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of the beloved son of God, the enemy is going to be at war with that. And so we trust our king, Jesus, to be our peace in the midst of conflict. And that's what the Philippians were doing when we experience conflict, God calls us to grow in thankful prayer, firmly planted in the gospel of, of Christ. So think about it. The church there in Philippi, they're centered on the gospel, but that's bringing conflict because the outside culture is telling them that they need to be more Roman or more Jewish. And the gospel is saying we need to be more Christ-like. And so we see conflict outside in the world, and we see conflict within as well. There's a conflict of sin still remaining in the believers. And so we feel that, right? We look around and we feel conflict in the world today. As beautiful and as much as you can see the glory of God around, you still feel that sin and conflict, that it, things are not quite the w right the way they are, that there should be a better relationship with the people and a better relationship with God himself. See, the church's gospel uh, gratitude grows in confidence and affection until the day we see Christ. The church's gratitude grows in confidence and affection until we see Christ. So that's, that's the main proposition, main idea we're going to talk about. So point one, the gospel gratitude grows in confidence. And this is verses 3 through 6. Gospel gratitude grows in confidence. Paul gets in there and he says, 
I am thankful. Like he, he finishes his greeting and he gets off like a, a sprinter. He's like, I am so thankful for what God is doing in you. And he opens, he basically writes his prayer out to them. He says, my God, every time I remember you, I remember you to God. And Paul doesn't thank, uh, thank them for, you know, we think of people say, well, I thank, I thank God for my house, my car. My... Paul's not going through things. What does he go to directly? He goes to people. He says, people are valuable to God. And people are valuable to me as I see the church living out the gospel. Paul doesn't thank God for things, but for people. See, the church is the source of his joy and thanksgiving. Even when you read Corinthians, as many problems as the Corinthian church has, Paul's still thankful for them. He's still thankful to see Christ growing in their midst and see uh, them becoming more and more like Christ. So we should be thankful we should be quick to be thankful rather than critical when we see any aspect of God working in people's lives around us because he is working. So how do you thank God for the grace you see in others? Maybe this week you can ask God to help you be grateful for those around you. Paul uses, uh, goes on to use his memory to pray for others. He says, remember how Jesus has rescued his people. So how do we pray for others to be rescued as well? Eucharist is the word there for thankfulness. And if you ever are around uh, higher church people, they call the communion table the Eucharist. And why they call it the Eucharist is because you come remembering Christ and are thankful for the gospel, for what Christ has done. And so that's that remembering and thankfulness. Our new life in Christ, in love, is grounded in Christ's life in love, right? 2 Corinthians 5.14, it's grounded in Christ. It's because of Christ. It's all of Christ from start to finish. Always, at all time, he's praying. He's thanking God. He's driven by necessity to ask God to, for help with them and to help them. In fact, he's saying... Uh, he said, this God is going to create. He says, uh, this, the Greek word there is create or order there in verse 4. He says, always at all times, I am making this prayer before you. And so God is bringing out of like all the thoughts he has for the church, he's bringing about thankfulness in Paul's life. So Paul sets the stage with that understanding that no matter how chaotic it is, God is making a way to be thankful with joy. Paul doesn't just say, I'm thankful. He says, I'm joyfully thankful. He says, every time I remember you. So Paul sets the tone. How many times in this book do you see joy over and over and over again? How many times when people today sometimes talk about things, joy is absent from the talk? We don't hear people say, I'm joyful and thankful for this. They say, well, I wish things were better. And I'm sure the Philippians could say the same thing. They're, they're in this ancient Roman culture. Uh, it's a consumer culture filled with, uh, with all kinds of games and distractions, sexual temptation, lavish parties, theaters, and more. And Paul writes from prison, but yet he's the most joyful person in Rome. Doesn't that strike you as, like, amazing? He's in prison. All these other people are out there looking for joy in the wrong places, and Paul says, my joy doesn't, isn't dependent on my circumstances. My joy is dependent on the living and ruling Christ. He's found joy in Christ, and it's a thousand times better than what the world offers. A thousand times better. Listen to St. Cyprian. This is amazing. He's witnessing to his friend, uh, Donatius, in the, I think it's the second or third century. But it's, this is an old writing that's been preserved. He says, this seems like a tearful world, Donatius. When I view it, from the fair gardens under the shadow of these vines. But he said, if I were to climb some great mountain and look over the wide lands, you know very well what I would see. Thieves on the high roads and pirates on the seas and amphitheaters filled with men being murdered to please the applauding crowds. And under all these roofs, misery and selfishness. It really is a bad world, Dinashes. An incredibly bad world. Yet in the midst of it, I have found a quiet and holy people 
that have discovered a joy that is a thousand times better than any pleasure of this sinful world. And these are despised and persecuted, but they don't care. These people, Danashis, are Christians, and I am one of them. Can you say that? That your happiness is tied to the everlasting joy that's found in Christ. Only Christ can fulfill and give a joy that's found in God himself. In fact, the psalmist, look at Psalm 42 and 43, He's wrestling back and forth with depression and a lack of joy. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And how does he end it? Hope in God. Our hope is in God. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said God's goodness and grace brings joy. That God's the bringer of joy. He said, preach the gospel to yourself instead of listening to yourself in the world. How are we bringing the good news into our lives, into others' lives, that we're saying, God is at work, he is good, and he's actively changing us. He's making us more like him. And on account of that, Paul talks about the partnership. So uh, many of you know that partnership actually is a, a Greek word that's common. A lot of people know koinonia, which means common fellowship or participation. And he's saying that you have common fellowship or participation in the gospel. In the gospel, a lot of times we throw that word gospel around. What is gospel? Gospel deals with uh, a joyful declaration of something that has happened. That something we thought would turn out bad ends up turning out good. So you think of uh, the story of marathon. You know, the first marathon runner actually died at the end of the marathon. That's why I don't run marathons. But he, he gets to the end of the 26 miles and he says, We've won. We've won. And that's what the gospel says about Christ, is that we've won because we have Christ as our king and conqueror, and that the victory is already done. He says, from the very first day, you've been partakers of that. So what does gospel partnership mean? It's a word that appears throughout Philippians, in Philippians 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it's fellowship, meaning that there's a common interest. Uh, so it would be uh, a joining of marriage or family uh, friendships or a business partnership. So D.A. Carson uses the illustration. He says, he says, if Harry and John go in together, buy a boat, start a fishing business back then in the first century, they would call this a fellowship because you're sharing a common business together. So koinonia really speaks to the fact that we are together in a gospel that binds us as greater than anything else in this world. It's like being part of a new family. It's having a new spirit, a new oneness in Christ himself. We're bound to Christ. He says, I'm sure of this. Verse 6, he says, I'm sure, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded. He that began a good work in you will carry it out. He'll keep doing it. And so the, the idea is that he's saying, I'm persuaded that Jesus is already working in you. He doesn't say, if you just try harder, if you just do more, maybe things will be better for you. He says, Jesus is doing this for you, in you, through you. So he's convinced of this. He says, you're being perfected. That word completion at the end, he says, you're being completely perfected until the day of Jesus Christ there in verse 6. See, Paul's reason for joyful gratitude and confidence in God's nature and purposes is because that God's promises will never be let down. He doesn't say, I promise, and then he doesn't fulfill it. He says, I promise, and he more than does it. That's our God. That's the reality of who God is. Spurgeon writes, I, I, I wish I could speak as well as Spurgeon at times, but Spurgeon writes, he said, if the Niagara Falls should suddenly be made to leap upward instead of downward, he said, that would be far easier. That would be le less of a miracle than changing the perverse and raging passions of men to renew the very core of manhood and to tear sin from the hold of a man's heart. This is not alone the he said, this is not alone just the finger of God, but the bearing of his arms, like his muscles, right? He says, conversion is a work comparable to making of the world. He only who fashioned the heavens and the earth could actually create a new nature in us. It is a work that is it's not paralleled. 
It, it is unique and unrivaled, seeing that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all must cooperate in this work. To implant the new nature in a Christian, there must be a decree from the Eternal Father from the past, a, a death of the Blessed Son in the past, and the fullness of the operation of the Holy Spirit working until now and until we meet to Christ. He said, it's a work indeed that labors of Herculean efforts. He said, Hercules accomplished trifles compared to what Christ did on the cross. You can slay lions and hydras and, and cleanse Aegean stables, but to turn a man's nature from darkness to light is a miracle of the greatest, of the greatest recreation. See, God's unstoppable work of grace in the believer's life, we can be confident of that. God will continue to complete what he started. He doesn't say, okay, I started it, like sometimes I start a book and I don't finish it. God says, I've started it and I'm going to complete it. No question about it. We have a God of promise, a God that fulfills his promises, that keeps working even in the midst of many people trying to stop him working, you cannot stop the strong harm, arm of the Lord. So here we are looking at this, and he says, remember, the cornonia is the work of God in, to form a people for himself. It seems both dimensions. You see, it's a personal and corporate. So it happens when you're in your quiet times, just reading your Bible at night or in the morning. And it happens together as we meet as a church. And both are gloriously true. We can be sure of this. In fact, Spurgeon tells another story. He says a good old minister was once asked whether he believed in the persecution, a, a perseverance of the saints, the final perseverance of the saints. Well, said, the, said he, I do not know much about that matter, but I firmly believe in the final perseverance of God, that where he has begun a good work, he will carry it until it is complete. To my mind, that truth includes the final perseverance of the saints. God promises and fulfills every aspect that he promises. What he says is true, and he acts accordingly. And even though we don't always see it in this day, when we get to that day, we will see it clearly. Because that day is coming sooner probably than we realize. And we should be looking for that day. That day should give us joy in this day. Salvation is the work of God from beginning to end. God is at work. He's sovereign. He inaugurates the work. He opens our hearts as he did with Lydia in Acts 16. He changes our lives in, in homes as he does with the jailer in Acts 16. So at the beginning of the, the church, you see that the confidence of God working, in fact, I'm sure if you looked on the outward appearance of this jailer, he's a rough military man that saw the, the battles all throughout. He was probably a retired Roman military. And yet he sees Paul living out the gospel and wants to know why he's different. You see, we must be confident in Christ and look to him. May God build our confidence in him that although you and I have incomplete projects all around, God never has an incomplete project at the end. All of us are being worked out by the hand of the master potter in working out every aspect of our lives. Everything is being renewed and transformed if we have our trust in Christ, if we look to Christ. If you haven't looked to Christ, talk to someone here before you leave, because this is of utmost importance. Trusting Christ brings about a confidence that will show itself faithful to the end. He is working. I, I, I think of uh, this pastor, Pastor Arquette Hughes he, of Wheaton Church. He writes, he said, as I reflect, he's, he's retired now, but he says, as I reflect on my 50 years plus in Christ, it is indeed God who has kept me. It is not my grip on God that makes, has made the difference, but his grip on me. He said, I'm not confident in my goodness. I'm not confident in my character. I'm not confident in my history. I'm not confident in my reverend persona. He says, I'm not confident in my perseverance, but I am confident in God. What a witness 
See, as a believer in Christ, you are as certain of heaven as though you were already have been there 10,000 years. God already, always finishes what he starts. So gospel gratitude grows in confidence and it continues in warm affection for God and his people. Point two, <clears throat> excuse me. Point two, gospel gratitude grows in affection. Just as it is right. Do you, Paul goes on, he says, this is right, this is good. It's the same word for righteous. And so Paul and the church have a deep affection towards each other. The good news is, is at the center of who they are and what God's doing. And he says that he holds them in his heart. The seed of, so in, in, in the Greek, it's kind of, in the Jewish understanding, it's the center of your whole human being. We think of heart as like Valentine's Day, right? Heart is emotions. But what he's saying, he's saying, every part of me thinks about what God's doing in you. My heart is set on the fact that I want to see you grow in Christ. That we're, we're partakers, we're sharing the same thing together, that good news, that we're in the grace of God, we're joyfully together in God. That even in my imprisonment, he's saying, even though I'm bound, he's like, I'm, in the word there, it means, he says, defensing the gospel, the apologia. He's giving answers for his hope in the gospel. He's saying this is the good news and this is why it's important to those that are around him in Rome as he's in prison. See, Paul had a deep affection towards the church there in Philippi. He had a deep affection that was so deep, he said it's, it's like, uh, the, the Greek word there it literally means like metal welded together. Metal welded together. How hard is it to get metal apart after it's been combined, right? You, you try and you're not going to break it very easily because it's, it's almost created another, it's like creating an alloy that it's melded and it's created as one in Christ. That their loyalty is bound to who Christ is and not necessarily to their identity as a Roman citizen or as a Jewish, a Jewish person. See, hospitality is being shown in immense ways. You think about it when someone goes to prison now, a lot of people go, okay, I'm not going to talk to that person. Or I'm not, uh, you know, but even then, it was much worse. When someone was in prison as an enemy of Rome, who's going to align themselves with someone like that? Because you could be called an enemy of Rome, right? But they go unashamedly and say, we're partakers with you, Paul. We're here with you. As these, these members of the Philippi Philippian church that are now poor because they've lost their status in society. They don't care about that. Christ is their riches. Christ is their commonality. Christ brought his friendship, brought this friendship and bound their spirits together. They're in common grace. C.S. Lewis uses the term, uh, the, the illustration, he says, what, you too? I thought I was the only one uh, talking about friendship. But the thing with the church is that the you two bound to each other as friends is that we share something radically deeper than just golf or whatever people center their lives around today. We share a good news that Christ is our king. He is the better king. It's a better news than anything you could hear in this world today. I, I think about fellowship too. So according to the idea of fellowship, uh, sometimes my mind goes over to Lord of the Rings. And if any of you have ever read Lord of the Rings or seen, probably more of you have seen the movies, the, the actual trilogy is very long. But it's worth reading. Because I think Tolkien, in his book, The Fellowship of the Rings, writes a thrilling story to illustrate the idea of gospel partnership. See, the fellowship is made of radically diverse people. There's little resilient pipe-smoking hobbits with big hairy feet. And then there's warrior men, there's a wizard, there's an elf with an amazing archery skills, it seems like he can shoot anything, and then out of under the mountain, there's this dwarf with an axe. But together, they're on common mission together, to defeat the darkness and bring peace to Middle Earth. And they are willing to die for one another for that mission. See, mission unites us here in the church today. Mission brings us together because we have a Savior that set us on mission. He said, this is 
I've come to seek and save what? The lost. I've come to declare the good news of the gospel. And so here we have as a Savior whose mission unites us under his word and his spirit and by the power of the gospel. <clears throat> God shows up in ways that even witness in the midst of persecution. Paul talks about in verse 8, he says, God is my witness to bear, and that's, that's that word for martyr, and it became known as people who witness for Christ to the point of death. In our culture, I don't know that some people back away when there's conflict. They look at conflict as the enemy. Well, I'm not going to ruffle feathers, you know, you hear culture talk about. And they, they, they try to, there's times when people try to silence the truth of who Christ is because it makes them, un, it, it makes them feel like they're sinners. The news is we are sinners. And so that's why Paul says, he says, I yearn. He says, the desire is deep that I yearn. I have affection towards. And the idea here uh, in the Greek, he says, it's in my intestines. It's in my guts. You ever hear you have that gut feeling? Paul's saying, my gut feeling is affection towards you. That's what he's saying. He's saying that to feel this way is what I'm supposed to be because I am one with you in Christ. I'm un my unity in Christ affects my relationship with you because it's bound to Christ together. He's the risen and conquering king. So the affection, how does that mark your life? It's not enough, James Montgomery Boyce, another pastor that's passed away to glory, he says, it's not enough to tolerate other Christians. You must enjoy their company. You must learn from them and furthermore, this fellowship must be one that is constantly expanding to include other Christians, even those that you have never met, but with whom you are united in Christ, in the Lord. See, wherever we look, our love, as we, as we talked about even in Sunday school, our love should be tied to the love that Christ has given to us. It's a, it's a love that, if it's not tied to who Christ is, uh, you might as well be a a gonging symbol, or something that sounds real loud, a noisy gong, a symbol, but really has no substance to it. So the gospel gratitude grows in affection and confidence, and it grows until Christ completes it all on that day. <clears throat> Point three, gospel gratitude grows until we see Christ. One day we're going to see Christ. And regardless of your view on eschatology, there's going to be a glorious return of Christ, and every believer should be looking forward to that day. And it could happen right now. It's an imminent day. It's an imminent day that Christ could come back. And either you're dreading it or you're looking forward to it. The priority of loving uh, is what Paul talks about, what Christ puts an emphasis on in John 15. He says, other believers... Um, it's, it's repeated in opening sections all throughout Paul's epistles, right? He says, Christ's love is our defining factor of who we are in him. So how does that connection of loving God and loving others affect your life? So the vertical love informs our horizontal loves, right? If we have this love for God, it's going to overflow into our love for each other. And it's going to keep on abounding. It's not going to be something that is rarely saw, seen. It's always going to be seen until we see Christ himself on that day. It should deepen. For, it should be a deepening love for God and others. Think about the good news, uh, the, the good Samaritan, right? The Samaritan saw his brother in need, and he stops, and he helps him. When we're gospel-bound, we look for those in need to share the gospel. Not because we're salesmen, but because we're members of a new kingdom. And that kingdom draws us to invite other people that are caught in darkness into his glorious light. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't say, well, it's just going to be you know, those people. He says, I want you to share this good news. What an amazing Savior we have. 
Abounding means to present and show abundantly, to keep on abounding. Think of the, um, think of the feeding of the 5,000, right? They get out there. There's only a few loaves of bread and fish. And what does Jesus do? He thanks God for them. He multiplies them. And at the end, there's baskets overflowing, abounding. That's our God. He abounds and he causes us to be a light in the world, to be a witness, John 13. See, we have, he, he calls for real knowledge. And this, this real knowledge, epignosis, um, is the idea of knowledge that is above other knowledges. He says it's upon other knowledge. It's built on something wiser, something better. And he says you have this knowledge in Christ. And what Paul means uh, John Calvin writes, he says, Paul means that it is full and complete, not a knowledge of all things, but it's fully complete in Christ. So it's tested. It's approved. He keeps going in verse 10. He says, you know, test and approve. Be pure, excellent. Be blameless. You see these words over and over again. And so the idea of approval is dakizomai, and it's the idea of testing materials or metals as they go through fire. So what happens when you put a metal through fire? All the dross comes to the surface. And Paul's saying, God's doing that in us through hard things, through the furnace of affliction, through difficult times. God is bringing about this testing to show that you are truly in him, to help you have confidence in him. The, the other idea is, he says, it's the excellence, to discern what is excellent and loving towards others. And so the testing is the idea of, um, think of a test drive or a baseball tryout. Someone's going to try to make the team, and God's saying he's doing that, he's making us what we will be. It's not us trying harder, but God is doing it internally, the work to produce something in us that we can't do ourselves. Like I said, like Niagara going backwards. Something greater than that. This, this is about something that's praiseworthy and excellent, as in Philippians 4 we'll find out. God, Paul is challenging us to look at the excellence of Christ to that day. See, the surpassing value of Christ is more than what you could imagine. What Any treasure you can imagine today, it's better than that. So, how are we pursuing knowledge in Christ with passion? Am I valuing knowing Christ above all else? Am I in the church, and in a church that teaches uh, the gospel faithfully, the Bible faithfully? Am I doing what is best in my life with my time, my money, my mind, my kids, the ministry, in my relationships? All these things we must ask ourselves. Because, not, not in a legalistic fashion, but because we want God to work. We want to put our, ourselves in the place of common grace for uncommon grace to happen. As we look to the word, as we look to fellowshipping together in Christ, as we allow the Holy Spirit to convict and lead us from sin to holiness, the gospel produces a pure heart. The word sincere comes from two words, the word for son and to judge. And the idea here is, in ancient times, you would have people creating these very costly uh, you know, vases and those type of things. And when there would be a crack in it, they would say, oh, I, I still want to be able to sell this for a high price. So they'd take wax and fill in that crack. And it was fine for a while. But once it got hot enough, what would happen? The cracks would be revealed, and the water or whatever was held in it would just come out. So what you would do in the marketplace, a lot of times you'd go into these cellars of stoneware and, and different, um, different porcelain type uh, things, and you would say, oh, I want that. And they'd say, okay, this is how much it, it's worth. Well, if you took it out into the sun and held it up, what do you think would happen to those cracks? You would see all those cracks if, if it wasn't truly whole. And so God is saying, or Paul is saying, in this passage, and God is telling us today, that there is an excellence 
There is something that is being tested in us that shows whether Christ has made our hearts complete or whether we're trying to do it in and of ourselves. So the sincerity is in the light of the judgment when we see Christ, will he see the cracks there? Or will we see that Christ has made us whole? And so we, we need to be aware. We need to look to Christ for everything. We need to submit to his word. For some, pe- some things, the day of Christ is a terrifying thing, right? You think about going to a judge. If you get a speeding ticket and go in downtown Perry, which I hear happens sometimes. <laughs> it's, you, you don't always like to go see a judge if you know you're wrong, right? But I think that maybe a better image for those who are in Christ, those who have made Christ their treasure and delight, would be that of a wedding day. I remember my wedding day, that even though I was nervous, I was looking forward to marrying my bride. And the day that I saw her walk down the aisle with her dad was a glorious day, right? We realize that that should be how we look at the day of Christ. That for some people it's terrifying, but it shouldn't if you are in Christ. We need to be filled to overflowing with the fruit of righteousness, verse 11 says. We need to live to the glory and praise of God through Christ. See, we have been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus, the fruit of righteousness which first began to sprout and to grow in our lives at the time of conversion, coming to Christ. This is practical righteousness. So we have a positional righteousness that's in Christ, right? So when we come to Christ, we're found in him, we're hidden in his life because we're saying, we're submitting to you, we're, we're believing and trusting that you are God, you are the son of God, But there's also a practical um, righteousness that comes out of that relationship. It's not self-produced. But when we plant our roots deep in the streams of Christ, in time we see fruit emerge. And that fruit is what shows our confidence is in Christ himself. We abide in him, John 15 says, and then we bear fruit. It's not we bear fruit to prove we're in him, it's we are in him, and we focus on him, and we trust him, and in time, he bears fruit in our lives. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's a beautiful picture of a God who doesn't say, do more, try harder, but instead says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He produces that, and in the end, we will glorify and praise our God. That's the outworking of a life hidden in Christ, unified in Christ, completely found in Christ. We pray for God to be glorified in his people, for God to make his glory known throughout the nations. How many people around the world have never heard the gospel? That's why we send missionaries. That's why we look to see the joy of the gospel declared in Africa, Asia, South America, in the islands, we want God to get all the glory. In fact, John 15, 8 says, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. God is producing the fruit. One of the commentators tells the story, and I've heard this story before, but a commentary that I was reading, he says, uh, Lawrence of Arabia brought a group of poor Bedouins to London and housed them in a beautiful hotel. The only kind of dwelling they had ever seen was a tent. Imagine this, you're going into this elegant hotel in London, and they've only been in a tent before. Well, they they were there for a while, and they quickly became fascinated with the faucets in the hotel. For in the desert, water was hard to come by. But in the hotel, they merely had to just turn a knob, and what? Water comes out, right? So when they went to leave, he heard this clank in their bags as they picked it up, and he realized they had packed the faucets in their bags. <laughs> they thought they would get back to the desert and be able to just like turn on water. And he had to explain to them, no, you have to be connected to a source of water. Our lives have to be connected to the living water, to Christ, in order for it to produce in us that fruit. And one day, one day, we'll see him face to face. And may that day we 
show that we belong to him because we worship and we love him. So grace, grace is grateful and grows in gratitude and affection until the day we see Christ one day soon. There's a newer song by uh, City of Light. It's a group from Australia. It's called uh, That Day, On That Day. He says, I believe in Christ, the risen, who's risen from the dead. He now reigns victorious. His kingdom knows no end. Through his resurrection, death has lost its hold. I know that in that day, I'll rise as Jesus rose. He says, on that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun. On that day, we will know you as we lift our voices one. Till that day, we will praise you for your never-ending grace, and we will keep on singing on that glorious day. Amen. Father, we are grateful. Our greatest purpose in life is to glorify your name. Fill our affections with the passion of your glory. Through Christ, give us power to glorify you in and through our lives, our homes, our church, our city, and to the world. Grant us the power to glorify you by the way we love, by the way we, we think, by the way we live. Help us to view the coming of Jesus, our Jesus, our Lord and King. In his name we pray. Amen.